Let's see, what do we got? You need one? Yeah, one two, three. Maybe like. What? What? Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You guys who were here last week. Um, know that we started 2 Corinthians. Because um, we had finished 1 John. Thanks, Amber. It's all right. We got a good. It's a good thing we are in a warehouse. There's no carpet. There's nothing. It's fine. It ain't got to be perfect. We can clean it up after. <laughs> All right. Dennis, that's my shirt. Okay, I don't know, but we'll, I got to do restocking. Tithing's low. So that jar back there, Shove, I want to see dollar bills in that thing, okay? It's not coming to me, it's going to the Lord. And if you uh, give it with a grumbling, pissed off heart, keep it. God doesn't want it. <clears throat> I haven't mentioned tithing in the, the whole year that we've been here, so yeah. So if uh, anybody wants to tie that old, I don't know, protein thing that Chris used to have, put a sticker on it. That's our tithing jar. So um, yeah. So we don't pass the basket, but it's just one of those things where it's there. So you guys know it. One day we'll do a a sermon on blessings that involve tithing and also in Acts when the person did hell back from the Lord and him and his wife were struck dead <laughs> really happened I need more cord um I don't think I'm gonna sit no I don't know okay we're gonna be in 2nd Corinthians chapter 1 um verse Three, I believe, because we just went through the first two verses last week, right? And bounced around. Oh, yes. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, Welcome DJ. <laughs> and Mike. We just finished worship. Perfect timing. Okay, so we're going to get in 2 Corinthians uh, cha or for chapter 1, verse 3. All right? And, um... I'm going to read the, uh, this little section, and then we're going to pray, okay? So, chapter 3, I mean chapter 1, verse 3, it says, blessed be, God, or, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with, we, with, with which we ourselves are comforted by God. That's a tongue twister. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, just like we have been talking about that, so 
through Christ, we shall share um, abundantly in His comfort too. If we are afflicted, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. And hope for you, our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Okay? Um, we might read that other little section after, but let's pray real quick. Father, we come before you and uh, I just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be here, Father God, and continue just to stay with us, Lord, and that these would be your words, Father God, what you want us to hear, Lord. And as we get into your word, Father God, and, and learn about, Father God, uh, the, how you comfort us in our um, afflictions and the, you know, the afflictions and things that we have to go through, Father God, I pray that you would make it real for us, Lord, that you would speak each to each one of us individually, Father God, because you have and want a relationship with each one of us, Lord. So I thank you and I praise you and I pray that you would speak here during this time. Amen. So, um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read a couple sections. i got some other um, verses to go to. It's going to be pretty cool, I think. So, it says, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort, okay? And who comforts us in all our afflictions, all right? So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So, you know, last week as... Uh, we, we dove into um, the will of God and uh, um, God's grace being favored. You know, there's the aspect of Christianity that um, a, a lot of people, you know, preach about this great life and this and that. And it's true. You do have, we have this joy that Jesus Christ comes. But the thing is, is that we are, like we talked about, on enemy territory in the darkness and as we become beacons of light and become Christ, and he, he, as He is sanctifying us, there is a process because the world is in us. Everything that we have done from a little kid punching our brother in the face or taking his candy or whatever we did um, to um, being grown up and doing horrible things, um, all that stuff is in us. So when we come to Jesus Christ, there is going to be suffering because we are going to have to, like we said, take up our cross, okay, and um, do things, deny ourselves and do things that um, we necessarily don't want to do, like letting go of certain things we are using or um, just different uh, addictions or things that are of this world. It could be staring in front of the TV instead of getting in the Word. God has banned me from satellite. I'm not kidding. Amen. I a couple times tried. Went to California and it was all set up. This dude came up everything, and but there was some past due amount that wasn't included in my bankruptcy somehow. They took my money and was like, "Oh, well, you owe us anyways, but we can't give you satellite." And then it happened again up here. And I was like, it just was so clear, you know. It's one of those things to where when you continue to push and push for something that you're kind of in limbo about, God will make it really clear because it should be, it should just usually happen, you know, when you're in prayer about it. So, anyways, I don't have satellite, but, um, you know, these different afflictions, um, you know, and it says that, that we are, that He does comfort us in our affliction so that we can comfort others, okay? So let's turn to um, Galatians 6. I kind of want to let all... I got a bunch of Scripture today. I want to let Scripture interpret all this because I'm not that smart. The Lord has to do it. 
So, 6.1. Galatians 6.1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, okay, restore him in spirit, in a spirit of gentleness, okay? Not, hey, you jerk. Remember what you just did over there? You know, we got to come in gentleness and meekness, not yelling and screaming and doing as the world would with proudful. Like, right now, uh, that this guy that I work with, he won't ever listen to this or be on my website so I can talk about him. Um, he, uh, um, he does, uh, um, I don't know, he's a stone guy, but I do business through him. And um, something happened on a job. I don't know what it is, um, but uh, I've been praying about things. But he's like, was continually to call. You know what I mean? On Sunday, like calling, texting, this is happening. Oh no, this, that. Just like this insanity. And um, I was kind of mad at first when I was thinking about it, but when I was um, over there praying, it brought to mind like myself in certain situations. Um, because even though he's doing that on a Sunday or whatever, you know, he is living in the world. And, you know, when I was living in the world and even saved, there is times where I was immediately just reacting all, all crazily and, and harshly, not realizing that the tone of my voice or the way I was sending texts um, might be received in not a gentle manner, that it was actually offensive. You know, so it is very easy to be offensive, especially when someone is slipping and transgressing or using. You know, sometimes we even don't want to bring it up and we want to avoid it because we don't want confrontation. So the, the thing is, what we got to do is that we need to learn how to do this, okay? So he says, keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted too. Okay, so this one also I have done. I've been like hanging around some friends as I was clean for a certain amount of time, but I ended up um, being like, you know what, I want to bring so-and-so to church. You know, and they were actively using, doing stuff. And what happened was, was I ended up using with them. I didn't end up bringing them to Christ. You know, it was just an excuse in my mind to kind of hang out with them. And, um, you know, the enemy used that somehow. And so um, it says that, keep watch on yourself, at least you be tempted too. So be careful, okay, when we are um, comforting and giving someone wisdom. Um, it says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Like he said, Love God with all your heart. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbors and as yourself. You know, love. And so we are supposed to bear each other's burdens. We're supposed to mourn with each other. And as we kind of talked about yesterday in the Beatitudes, and um, we are supposed to guide them with Scripture, okay? As we see, it says, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who is taught the word share all the good things with the one who teaches. Okay? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh, from the flesh, reap corruption. corruption. But the one who sows spirit, or out of the spirit, will from the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. You know, as we, as we do these things and bear each other's burdens and do stuff, you know, there is a thing of growing weary. You know, there is times, even with what I'm doing down here, um, especially like last year in the park when it was week after week setting up that there was times the enemy would really attack me because I was um, getting past the point in my relationship with God that was that I'd never had been before, you know, and I didn't have other pastors or this or that. People, um, you know, were actually, some certain people were not really a fan of what I was doing. And, 
you know, the one thing is, is that getting that rest in Christ, you know, when I would begin to get weary and get tired and feel like giving up, I would rest in the Lord. I would seek Him. And I would have to go get filled. Because when we want to help and encourage someone, you know, if we, if we are not prayed up, if we are not in the Word, if we are not seeking God and feasting on Him and resting in Him, what good are we going to be to our friend who's in hurt except for to give them basically world device. We're going to be empty. So, as it says in the, at, the, at the end of this little section, it says, um, uh, so we do not give up. So then, as, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those are, uh, who are of the household of faith. Okay, so, especially of our brothers and sisters, all right? We need to look out for each other. Those who are in this church, those who are friends and family, we need to look out for each other. We need to be praying for each other. Okay? Um, and this is the thing, is that sometimes there's, there's suffering involved in this. You know, the, 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 some, the truth hurts. It's a true thing. You know, a lot of times we are in denial about stuff and um, we don't really want to face the facts. Okay? And um, verse... And, Hold on, I gotta flip back real quick. In uh, verse five in Second Corinthians, it says, "For we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too." Okay, so Christ, you know, so Christ's example. He gives us a, a really good example that Paul lays out on the line in um, Philippians two. Um, one, we'll start. He says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Okay? Having the same love. Being in full accord, or in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, okay? In humility, count others more significant for yourself. Let each of you do not look out for your own interests only, okay? But it says, also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Jesus, in Christ Jesus, who thought who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, okay? Jesus Christ, being God, had emptied himself in the form of a servant. He sets the bar for that humility right away from his birth. As you know, we have been looking at, and we looked at um, in the birth of Christ, and just the humility of that, how he came into the world. Um, you know, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. Okay? So, that, the bar right there is set for us to imitate Christ in humility. When we are to... Um, go through things or our neighbors going through things. We are to handle that with meekness and love and gentleness and humility. Um, he says uh, right there, and uh, do, 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 therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Or should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That, mean, that means whether you are believe in Christ or not, everyone will bow to Jesus Christ, to God. And it says, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You are going to confess that He is Lord even if you are not following Him when you are or we are possibly on our way to hell if we do not know Him, if we are not of Christ. And, um, you know, he, 
he goes on and he, and he says, you know, about being lights in the world. You know, and, uh, you know, he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you always have obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, we are supposed to have a godly fear, a, a godly fear of God, like a, a healthy fear. And um, he says, For it is God who works in you both to, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Do, okay, it says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Hold on, holding fast to the word of life. Okay? Holding fa fast to Jesus Christ so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. You know, Christ, as we talked about, I believe it was last week, and um, serving Him, it is a, um, when we become saved, it is that impact that we have, you know, that change. We are now um, out of humility and love serving the Lord. And when we are doing that, that is to be and just be coming out of us to our, our, our neighbors, our, whether if it's uh, people we don't like, whatever it is, we are to look out for one another, and especially those of the faith, that's those who are of us, okay? And, and um, you know, suffering, you know, Romans 5 says it good about, the, about suffering, the reason for suffering, and the reason that these trials and tribulations do happen, and that we go through them. I mean, even with Jesus, as it said, that with the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. Okay? So, it says in Romans 5, 1, that therefore since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained faith into grace, into this grace which we now stand. And we rejoice in this grace, or in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, okay? This is completely opposite of the world, because worldly, when I was in pain and struggling or whatever, my sufferings, I you know, sought booze and drugs and whatever it was and destructive family just so I could feel better and not think about whatever it was. But this is saying that we should rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because the love of God or because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So, this suffering and stuff that we go through, you know, we can give up when we, when we hit these things and the parable of the sower hits it pretty good that, that if we do not have a faith that takes root, but that we just take these words when we're in church, take them lightly, oh, I kind of heard part of what he said, but I was doing this or doing this during the service and I'm going to go out and just live my life the way I want to, but you know, I'm going to kind of come in once in a while and just get a pep talk. The thing is, is that if we are not driven by Jesus Christ, if Jesus Christ is not the purpose of our life and the reason that we are living and the every day that we want to get to know Him more by praying and seeking His face, when we have problems, we go before Him and we deal with it by seeking Him and by that happening, we are knowing Him more, being sanctified. But if we are just going about, and we say, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe He did. And we know that the demons do too. They shudder at the fact. It does not know, it's not just about believing what He did. You have to have a relationship with Him and confess your sins to Him and repent from your life in the world and recognize that we, we are nothing. We are messed up. We read in Romans last week what we are apart from God. Throat as an open tomb. No, no fear of God. We are disgusting, filthy. You know, the inside of us is full of rotten darkness. And so God's light, 
you know, is the only thing that when it does hit that darkness in us, there is suffering. There's stuff that we got to go through. And just the story about, the old story about Joseph I wanted to touch on, the way he handled his situations, you know, Joseph in the Old Testament in uh, Genesis, right? Um, the way he handled stuff is awesome. It's how we should handle it. Okay? So this is it. In Genesis um, 37, I believe. Yeah. Okay. In Genesis 37, now you guys remember the story of Joseph a little bit, right? He, the robe and everything. He had a nice robe. His dad got him. He was the favorite. It says it in here that he was the favorite. Um, and uh, he made his brothers mad. He, he would tell them his, their, his dreams. You know, I had a dream that you guys were bowing before me and all this stuff. And they already kind of didn't like him because he was dad's favorite. But they took it to the next level, okay? They, um, in verse, uh, let's see, 27, it says, Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. They were going to kill him, but it said they put him in this pit. Okay? And then they end up taking him out and sell him to these Ishmaelites. And they said, Let us let not our hand be upon him, for he's our brother in our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then the Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They, and then they took Joseph to Egypt. Okay? So, that's not going very good right away. You know, Joseph is um, sold to Egypt. It's to these people who get sold to Egypt. Okay? But this is the thing. Joseph was a godly man. He sought God. And we'll see this because God was with him. In, in chapter 39, it says, <clears throat> um, and the Lord... Okay, he ended up going... Um, to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him from the Ish bought him from the Ishmaelites, brought him down there, and the Lord was with Joseph. Okay, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of the Egyptian master, and the master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor. In his sight. Remember favor. So that's grace. He found favor in his sight. Well, actually it's um, non-deserving favor. But he didn't. He was a slave. So he did not deserve favor from this guy. He basically found grace in this guy's eyes. And so <clears throat> he continued to <clears throat> grow, right? And, but there comes a problem, okay? This dude's wife, while he's out of town, it says Joseph, you know, it talks about being a handsome man and stuff. And um, this wife wanted Joseph to, you know, sleep with him, right? So, she comes in. Now, Joseph has said in verse 6, was a handsome man and, a, and a, in form and appearance. So, he must have been buff. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused, okay? He refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has Con, has no concern about anything in the house and he has put me in charge of everything. He is, he is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you because you are his wife. And then he says something that is awesome. How then can I do this great witness, wickedness and sin against my God? That's a godly thinking. That is what something that should come across our mind if we are serving the Lord and things are happening in, in life and situations and be like, oh, how should I, I'm not going to do this. God would not like this. I need to pray. So, he, it says, after he says this, he said, and he spoke, and as she spoke to Joseph, day after day, he would not listen to her, okay? Um, to lie with her. So he continued to refuse her. And I'm sure Joseph was in prayer talking to the Lord because that's not a good situation. His boss can do whatever he wants with him. So one day, um, basically, she caught him and um, was really trying to get him this time. And um, 
<coughs> it says a piece of garment as, as he took off, ripped off of him. And down in verse 15, she said, as soon as um, he heard that I lifted up my voice and I cried out, and he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. She's telling this story to these, these the rest of these guys. Then she, then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. Okay, so she's claiming rape here, basically. All right? She, she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to and laughed at me. But as soon as I lifted him up, my voice and cried, he left the garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words come out of his, that his wife spoken to him, he said to him, this is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confirmed, confined. And there he was in prison. Okay? He's in prison, all right? He doesn't have no attorney or nothing. There's, he is in prison. This woman who is very high up, you know, she said it. What's he going to do? You know, and the, so the dude reacts. But listen to this, okay? Joseph obviously is not grumbling and complaining. He is going through a trial and a tribulation. And he is trusting in God. And look, it says, where he's confined in verse 21 of 39, it says, but the Lord was with Joseph, okay? So the Lord is with him and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison, okay? And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything because of Joseph was in charge, because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So, even in prison, Joseph still rejoiced in the Lord. He still was praising God. Okay? Me in that situation, I'd be like, God, you know I didn't do this. What is going on? You know? But he, he takes his spot. Okay, is he in prison? He's in prison. God gives him favor in the prison. Okay? And you see, he's... Uh, we're going to see how he does bear his brother's burdens and his friend's burdens. He's going to um, continue to follow God. And it says, and one night, no, it says, and sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their Lord, and Pharaoh was angry and put them both in prison. They're both in prison. Okay? 40 verse 6. When Joseph came to them in the morning... You know, I don't know what he was doing. He saw that they were troubled. Okay? He saw that they were troubled. So obviously he had been talking with this guy, these guys, and, and conversing, and maybe praying for them. I don't know. But he obviously cared about them. Because he looked at them, and he knew that he knew something was wrong. You know, when, you know, a friend of yours that you know, right? A friend of yours that you might know, their, their face. You can tell when something's wrong. And you can tell if something's up or if they've done something. Right, Josh? Yeah. Um, so, this is the thing. Is that when we are around our friends, our um, loved ones, or even people who we don't know that we just end up in circumstances with, we are to pray and to seek them and to bear their burdens. Joseph come and seen that they were troubled. And so, he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody, why are your faces downcast today? What's the matter? You know, he's asking him, what's wrong? He genuinely cared, okay? So, this is what he does. He says, well, after he asked him, they said to him, we've had these dreams and there's no one to interpret it. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? It's a very, very simple thing. He, he, he had, he did not worry about it. You know, he knew God would take care of this. So he doesn't. So he says, please tell them to me. Okay? So basically, he, he interprets both their dreams. Okay? And he says, um, to the one, uh, I believe the cup there, he says, in three days, we'll lift up your voice, or the Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore to you your office. And you shall place the Pharaoh's cup in his hand 
as formerly when you were his cupbearer. And he says, only remember me when it is well with you. And please do me this kindness to mention me to Pharaoh so I can get out of this house. For I was stolen out of the land of Hebrews and also I've done nothing that they should put me into this pit. Okay, so Joseph is, gave this guy his interpretation and asked this of him. Now the baker, he, he also was straight up with the baker. He did not lie to him because his uh, story was going to be uh, tragic news. He probably wanted the baker to know that, um, hey, you, you only have a certain amount of time left because the baker's dream, he said that he is going to basically behead you in three days. And he gave the baker that news. Now, he gave it to him in love. You know that he did because by telling him that and interpreting the dreams, sometimes you do have to tell people what they don't want to hear. And it's a rough thing, especially with friends and especially with people you don't know, whatever. Especially that you are going to die in three days and you need to make right with God. That's what he told him. So, this is the thing. The, 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 it goes as Joseph interpreted. You know, exactly as what happened. Okay? And the cupbearer is restored to his spot. And it says, uh, it, the cupbearer forgot about Joseph. Okay? Two whole years go by. Alright? Two whole years go by. And... During that time that you don't, you don't think that the Lord, or I mean that Joseph was, uh, you know, I don't know, up, worried about what was going on, that I might be in here forever. God, I help these guys. I've been in here for no reason. I'm continued to be here in for no reason. So, listen, there is this thing that he knew that no matter what, Joseph still continued to serve God and continued to look to Him no matter what was going on. Okay? No matter the, all the distractions in jail and the people coming in and out, all the different stuff, he kept his eyes focused on Christ. And this is the thing. Joseph, the, the, the Pharaoh ends up having a messed up dream. Joseph ends up rising to power through this. Through all these tribulations, you know, that he has endured up and down. And it says even at this time, he was 30 years old when he's restored. The Lord restored to him this power. And he ended up being able to bring his family over to Egypt out of this, um, where the land was uh, in drought. And he was blessed. He was blessed the whole time during his life. And um, even his sons, his source for Manasseh, he said for he said, God has made me forget all my hardships and all my father's house. And his second son, Ephraim, he made, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. So out of that affliction, out of what we read in 2 Corinthians when it talks about that, you know, when Paul is talking to him and saying that, you know, we are bearing your guys' affliction when uh, you guys are being afflicted, when you guys are being, um, you know, uh, uh, cared for, or what's the word to use? I can't remember. I got to go back to it. Comfort. That's the whole thing. Yeah, comfort. So that's the whole thing. When you're being comforted, we are going to bear with you. You know, for um, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. See, Paul lays it out in this next session. It says, in verse 8, it says, look, we do not want you to be aware, brothers, of the affliction that we experience. We're not talking about some light stuff here. He even gives him an own little pit of the story. He says that, indeed, we felt, or he said, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength um, in Asia, that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Okay? They thought that they were going to die. They were getting ready to give up. But this is the thing. This is, this is it right here. 
He says, but that was only to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly pearl and He will deliver us. On Him we have set our hope that He will deliver us again. You know, that is the thing, is that not only when they were in that situation and caught up in the moment, right? Like just like Joseph and the stuff he was doing, even though that, that affliction lasted for years, okay? Years. I get anxious and stuff when stuff don't happen in two days, you know? And we got to be patient and endure and let the Lord do His work in us. Because this affliction, these trials that we go through, we don't just magically go like this and have all that stuff from the world disappear. You know, God is working in us each and every day. He is, there's this process called sanctification. And when we are His, this process begins. And in Philippians 1.6, it says that He will complete that work until the day of Christ. So we never are going to arrive. We are always going to go through hardships. We are always going to go to mountaintops, be down in valleys. But this is the key, is that He said, we thought we were going to die, we were ready to give up. But that was just to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who does everything, who always delivers us out of our affliction, who, who on Him we have set our hope that He will deliver us again. So next time the situation comes, do you think that Joseph... Because he was only 30 years old, right? When he had done all that time in prison, been sold, all the stuff with his family. Don't you think that after that, the trials and tribulations that came, the stuff that the Lord had prepared Joseph through and done that stuff through and was sanctifying him and was doing that work in, that after that, a lot of stuff was kind of maybe didn't, you know, it wasn't so hard. He was just looking to God because he remembered, hey, God never forgot about me when I was in prison for three years or so for nothing. And from that, and from seeking Him during that time, He restored me to all this. And if little problems or this happened with His family when they came back or whatever else happens, you know that, you know, we remember on those times. I remember on the times when, um, a couple of years ago, when the Lord began to restore to me the joy of my salvation and my life after three or four years of backsliding and messing up and doing this and doing that. And finally I understood that it was just God and God alone. And that was it. Not relying on myself for anything. Not relying on my friend for anything. But relying on Jesus Christ. So to Him and Him only should we be looking to. And when we go through our afflictions, when we go through our battles, when we go through whatever it says in here, we know that if we are going through something and we are saved, we are Jesus Christ, we are His, that we can be sure that Jesus is sanctifying us, that He is doing something in us that, yeah, it might suck right now, but in it, through, that little ver through the verses in Romans, that, produces, that patience produces character, character produces hope, and that the peace of God ends up, I mean, that joy that we have, we know that we are going to come out of it. Because looking to God and God alone, like Paul says right here, we, we were made to not rely on ourselves. He, that was the realization. But on God, who raises the dead, He delivered us from such a deadly pearl. It must have been a horrible situation. So we see it through Paul, through the apostles, through um, whatever, and through um, as Paul um, is telling us in this, you know, it continues on through now. You know, there's always problems, always situations, always things that we got to deal with. But the thing is, if we are Christ and we are His and only His, and He is our motivation, He is the reason that we live and we look to Him for everything. He begins to change the desires in our heart. He begins to do works in us. Sometimes it'll feel our life will be flipped upside down, but it's because God is taking stuff out so He can dwell in there. Because the world and God cannot both dwell in us. Okay? We will serve one or the other. We can't straddle the fence. We're going to fall back to the world. 
So, um, I'm going to close this in prayer. You want to do one last song, guys? Um, the, uh, this week, I'd ask you that uh, the story of Joseph from chapter 38 or 39 right there in Genesis, I'd ask you guys, read that. Read through that story and see what God does in Joseph's life. I mean, we kind of just skimmed and hit the main points of it, but it's pretty amazing to see. And, um, you know, we're not, we're not in prison. We're not in, um, we're in America, you know. Even though we might be in bad circumstances, it doesn't matter. We got Christ, okay. We look to Christ. That's all that matters. So this is going to do this last song and close us in prayer.